there has never been anyone that enjoyed politics more than I did. I enjoy them today, if, uh, but the time has uh, passed me. I've got too old to fool with it. And I called Jimmy down in Plains and uh, told him, I said, Jimmy, it is time for you to meet with George Meany. George was still living at that time. And uh, he says, Herb, I know it is. And said, it's past time. But says, I cannot afford to uh, put in a call to uh, George Meany at the AFL-CIO and have him to turn me down. He said, that would kill me. And uh, I says, well, do you have any objection for me of calling and making an appointment? And he said, I would always be grateful. I picked up the phone and called Washington and called our Hope Department and Al Barkin. And uh, I'm going to tell you just the way he talked. I says, uh, Al, I would like to bring uh, Carter up to Washington and meet with President Meany. And he said, well, Herb, let me talk to George and I will call you right back. That's just the way he talked. And so about, uh, about uh, five minutes later, the phone rang, and it was Al Barkin, COPE director. And he says, George said, all lines are open. Tell Carter to call. Anyone who goes into public service is, is automatically my hero because it is a wonderful undertaking. But anyway, I have did a lot of things uh, in, in the community, but I've never in my 84 years ever had one thing that I saw produce results as quickly as the Georgia Project. When we brought that first teacher into the school of Dalton, it changed the whole attitude of the school. But with Daddy, whenever the truck cranked, you know, of course I'd, I'd be in it. And uh, he'd say, uh, let's see, he called me baby until about until I got married, and then he started calling me Miss Eunice. But he would say, uh, baby, if you want to go with me, go powder your nose. And I'd go in and feel around on my mother's dresser till I found the powder box, and Daddy said I'd come out looking like I'd been in the flour barrel sometimes, but <laughs> off we'd go. And, and we would go like to the uh, uh, general store in Brookfield. Mm -hmm. Lot of interesting talk there. Uh, men probably, they, they probably didn't cuss as much then, though, anyway, as they do now. Uh, so they uh, didn't hear cuss words. But, man, I heard all about Roosevelt. I heard about Talmadge. And I heard the reasons that it made a difference. But farmers are eternal optimists. And so this next crop is going to be better. And this time we're going to elect somebody that'll be, be good for us. Uh, first of all, as we all know, the Republican Party has taken over the General Assembly and the governor's office. Yes. What happened? We got beat. <laughs> no. Well, you know, I look back on it like this. I'm a historian. And if I had a baseball team that had won the World Series for 129 straight years and then lost a few World Series, would that be a bad run? The Democrats had a good run. And it was time, it's like pruning a, 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 a your favorite bush. You prune it in the, in, you know, maybe in the fall whenever you prune and it looks all scrubby. But then in the spring it, re, it blossoms with greener, more vibrant leaves and beaut more beautiful blossoms. That's what's going on to the Democratic Party. Uh, we're being pruned. But as I speak, clearly the National Democratic Party, and I think the State Democratic Party, is on its way back. There's always a flux and a flow, a thickening and a thinning, a yin and a yang in politics. You stay in it long enough, 
you're going to get beat or you're going to win. One, it can't but one or two things happen. And so it's just part of the evolution. And at the end of the day, we will have, we'll be a better party for what has occurred over the last 10 years. Shortly after Dad moved home, there was a, a huge uh, movement for to keep our schools segregated and the White Citizens Council. A group of Dad's customers came to him and asked him to join the White Citizens Council. He refused. And they wanted him, they wanted, one of the guys said, I'll give you the $20 to join. And Dad took the crowd back into the toilet at the Carter's Warehouse and flushed $20 down the toilet. And we lost 95% of our customers. Um, I think Dad's net profit for the next two years combined was about $460. And we needed George Busby when he came on as governor. And I've bragged about the success of Governor Carter's reorganization. Part of that success, indeed maybe all of it, is because due in large part to the fact that uh, the Governor Busby implemented all those things, uh, followed up on, on, on making it work. And of course, there were, he was not a bashful individual. I mean, he would wait into any group of people, didn't make it to who they were, uh, what race, creed, color, national origin, he weighed right into that crowd. And a lot of times, you know, when they, when he left, you'd see the people shaking their head, but saying, hey, you know, maybe there's something here. And that tactic was pretty much used through every, every political campaign that I was involved with him with. And of course, uh, like you said, uh, you run a couple of times for mayor, you run a lieutenant governor, you lose, and all at once, you run for governor and you're elected. Uh, it was the mood of the times the change of the people. It, when, when Governor Maddox took over, Speaker Smith realized that they had elected him, and so Speaker Smith basically assumed a lot of the powers that previous governors had. As I understand it, that governor, uh, uh, the previous governors would almost appoint who was going to be the speaker and who was going to be in the chairman, please say. And so Speaker Smith recognized this political thing and basically grabbed the power away from, from Governor Maddox. I think Governor Maddox was, uh, I won't say he was naive, but it's, I think Governor Maddox wanted to get along and so he did not resist it as a Carl Sanders might have done it. Uh, and so then the power, basically more power shifted to the General Assembly. Uh, it became less of a strong governor than we previously had. I called Betty Vandenberg and I said, can I come up and visit and let you tell me about the mansion? So we fly to Atlanta. Uh, it's raining. And we go out, I go out to the mountain, uh, mansion and he goes to a meeting. So Betty, you know, greets me and we sit down and talk and then we have a bite to eat at lunch. And uh, the man that worked for her came in and said, Miss Vandiver said the house is leaking upstairs. And she said, well, go get the buckets. The, the fact of the matter is, for, for me, serving as Attorney General, I was a little bit of a renegade in that I didn't have a lot of political allies, both from the standpoint of what I thought was right and from the standpoint of what was practical, political for me, it was easy to be for open government. I mean, it's just that simple. Right. I think most of the money spent in campaigns is wasted, and it's a grim thing to say, but you see, for every, every time you've got the money, there's a new product that they can produce to you. They're the, the focus groups, they're, they're the polls, they're the push polls, they're the um, telephone uh, calls, they're all kinds of, let's put, let's put it, as long as the money is there, they're going to be creative and innovative ways to spend it. And I think most of the money that's spent on political campaigns doesn't contribute to the bottom line of producing votes.